Good afternoon. Thank you again for joining us for the 2022 Honorable James R. Browning Symposium. My name is Emily Steinberg, and I'm a member of the Montana Law Review. Our third and final uh, panel today is titled De A Declaration of Rights, the Future of Montana's Liberties and Freedoms. It's my privilege to introduce our moderator for this panel, the Honorable Leslie Halligan. Judge Halligan currently serves as a district court judge for the 4th Judicial District here in Missoula. She was appointed to the bench in 2015 and elected in 2016 and 2018. Judge Halligan is a graduate of this school and she received the Distinguished Alumni Award in 2020. Before taking the bench, she served as a standing master for judges Ed McLean and Karen Townsend of the 4th Judicial District. Judge, Hall judge Halligan is a past president of the State Bar of Montana and also a past president of the Western Bar of Montana Association. She's also a current ABA member. She received the State Bar Pro Bono Service Award in 1999 and a Public Service Award in 1999 from the Western Montana Bar Association. Please join me in welcoming Judge Leslie Halligan. So thank you all so much. I'm very honored to have been asked. Emily served as uh, my summer uh, law student intern, or law clerk intern, and she did a fabulous job. I feel very honored to be asked and also to have an opportunity to speak with these young scholars. Um, certainly Emily's following in their footsteps, but I've um, been very pleased just to meet our panelists informally, and I know that you'll really appreciate uh, what they have to say and how they look at the positive growth of our Constitution and development of our Constitution. We're here really to talk about the future of the Constitution, how to develop these rights and liberties that we um, embrace. And as the um, Constitutional Convention, and many of you heard perhaps Maynan and others speak about um, just the process in developing a positive focus on the Constitution to help us with a clean and healthful environment. And so I'm very excited to hear uh, from all of these uh, presenters. They all um, have done much work in this area, and I know that you'll benefit from that. So I'm going to give you just a brief introduction with regard to all of us. We're all of the folks who will be presenting, and I'll encourage them to add to their resumes in the event that I've missed anything or their bio bios. So Emily uh, Zakin is joining us uh, remotely. Um, Emily is currently an associate professor of political science at John Hop Johns Hopkins University. She received her PhD from Princeton University and her BA from Swarthmore, Swarth Swarth Swarthmore College. She's also been a member at Institute for Advanced Study, School of Social Science. Her research focuses on constitutional theory and American political development. Her book, Looking for Rights in All the Wrong Places, Why State Constitutions Contain America's Positive Rights, published by Princeton University Press in 2013, highlights America's neglected positive rights tradition and explores its origins in a variety of social movements. Her other research in constitutional theory, um, which has uh, been co-authored, has been published in the Chicago Law Review and the American Political Science Review. Her work also appears in Law and Society Review, Law and Social Inquiry, Studies in American Political Development, and the Oxford Handbook of the U.S. Constitution. Emily's current book project, co-authored again with Chloe Thurston, examines America's long history of debt relief and the constitutional controversies surrounding it. So the first thing Emily said when she introduced herself was she wasn't a lawyer but she brings much um, experience and a wealth of information to help us all understand the underpinnings of the Constitution, its development, and, and kind of the bright future that we all envision for our state constitutions. Um, next to me is Constance Van Clay. I'm very excited to hear that Constance is part of Upper Seven Law. Upper Seven Law is a generalist nonprofit law firm funded primarily by donations and focused on matters um, that uh, we really, uh, unfortunately, don't have enough firms focusing on. Um, she works uh, and represents individuals and organizations in state and federal matters, focusing on government and corporate accountability. She's a graduate of the University of Montana School of Law, graduating in 2017 and finishing as first in her class. She's a non-traditional student, a mother um, with children. And obviously from her credentials, she's done lots of work and continues to shine. 
Um, she uh, served as co-editor-in-chief of the Montana Law Review. Following graduation, she's uh, clerked for the Honorable Sidney Thomas, Chief Judge of the Ninth Circuit, and for Judge Dana Christensen of the U.S. District Court for the District of Montana. She lives and works in Missoula, and she also examined in her uh, work as a law student um, much of the provisions with regard to special legislation, and I hope that she'll speak a bit about that. Um, uh, and then we also have, um, from afar, Anthony Sanders. And Anthony uh, comes to us as a senior attorney from the Institute for Justice. It's a nonprofit public interest law firm whose mission is to end abuses of government power and to secure the constitutional rights that allow all Americans to pursue their dreams. He litigates constitutional cases, protecting economy, uh, economic liberty, private property, freedom of speech, and other individual liberties in both federal and state courts across the United States. Within the Institute of Justice, he's the director of the Center for Judicial Engagement. In this role, he educates the public about the proper role of judges in enforcing constitutional limits on the size and scope of government. And of course, in my role, I'll be particularly keen to listen to his advice. One of the areas of Anthony's expertise is the use of state constitutions to protect individual rights. He's the author of the forthcoming book, published by, will, which will be published by the University of Michigan Press, titled Baby Ninth Amendments, How Americans Embraced Unenumerated Rights and Why It Matters. A prolific writer, Anthony has also written several law review articles on constitutional law and opinion pieces published in leading media outlets. He regularly speaks uh, to groups about constitutional law, and he hosts the weekly podcast called Short, Cir Short Circuit, which um, he had done actually yesterday, I believe, and I can't wait to hear it, but the file was too big, so I couldn't listen to it uh, today, and he couldn't post it last night. So I encourage you to kind of look into that. I'm sure it's a lively and fun look at circuit court cases. Prior to joining the Institute for Justice, Anthony worked for several years in private practice in Chicago and served as law clerk to Justice William Leaphart on the Montana Supreme Court. So he has clearly a, a great Montana connection. He received his law degree from the University of Minnesota Law School in 2004, where he served as an articles submission editor for the Minnesota Law Review. He received his undergraduate degree from Hamline University and his master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's a dual U.S. and U.K. citizen and grew up both on Vashon Island in Washington State and um, in, the, um, in Alderney, in the, British, Alderney. Yeah. in the British Channel Islands. So please welcome our guests, and we'll start with Emily, and then move to Constance, and then Anthony. So thank you again. We'll give you just a little round of applause. Okay, can everyone hear me? How's Emily's sound? Yes. Great, Good, thank you. And thank you for that extremely generous introduction. It's a pleasure to be here even across the screen and I'm very sorry I can't join you in person. I am at the big annual meeting of the American Political Science Association. Uh, and because I'm a political scientist, my work is generally addressed less to those hoping to use state constitutions to make legal arguments and more to people interested in characterizing America's constitutional history, culture and tradition. Now, historically, scholars had made these characterizations of the U.S. Constitution and its tradition, looking most of, of America's Constitution, rather, looking mostly at the federal document, at the U.S. Constitution. There were, of course, scholars of state constitutionalism, but state constitutions tended, tended to be studied separately from the federal constitution. And I think one exciting development in the study of state constitutions is the way that people, and I think John Dynan has also been a part of this conference, and I certainly count him as at the forefront of this movement, but the scholars of U.S. constitutionalism have begun to think about state constitutions not as a separate kind of document apart from the U.S. Constitution to be studied in its own silo, but as part of the U.S. constitutional tradition. After all, states govern a large number of important issues. And as the Supreme Court turns rightward, that seems like it might become increasingly true. Now, my book on state constitutions was about rights in particular. And I argued there that we ought to include state constitutions in our broader view of the US rights tradition. One reason for this is that the Bill of Rights in the US Constitution was written for a very specific purpose. 
As, as you all know, this is written to mollify the anti-federalists who were suspicious about creating a new national government. But that does not mean that the Bill of Rights reflects a suspicion of government in general. So when people look at the U.S. Bill of Rights and claim that it captures or characterizes America's general suspicion of government, a desire to keep government away from us, not get government's help, I think we should contest that inference. Remind people that, in fact, this is one document among many other bills of rights, including state bills of rights. In addition, as a result of some combination of rules and norms, the text of the US Constitution has turned out to be quite rigid. It's been amended very infrequently. And so it doesn't make for an especially good mirror of America's changing ideas or principles. So in that book, I argue that state constitutions have to play a role in our characterization of the US rights tradition. And my point there was the United, that the United States does not have an exceptional rights culture a culture especially committed to keeping government away from its citizens, but that we have a much richer mixture of rights. Some of these rights reflect a suspicion of government power, but others embody the desire to force government to do things for its citizens. So that was my, my first work on state constitutions. Um, but lately, I've been revisiting the idea of rights in state constitutions because I've been groping toward an argument about how we should understand rights um, not, not a particular mix of rights, do we have positive or negative rights, but the concept of rights in general. And this is very early in my thinking, so I hope you will bear with me as I try out some new ideas. I'm interested in challenging the conventional account of rights as constraints. So I, I don't know if you're familiar with this analogy, but the way I learned to think about rights was through the Ulysses metaphor. Ulysses famously tells his sailors to tie him to the mast of his ship so that he will not be able to heed the siren's call and steer his ship into the rocks. Rights in this metaphor are the ropes that bind us to the mast. No matter how much we want to do something, persecute a religious minority, say, rights prevent us from yielding to that dangerous passion. They keep our ship of state on course. In this scenario, rights are generally understood as protecting individuals against majoritarian politics. And the mechanism through which they offer that protection is judicial enforcement. Courts enforce individual rights against the government. And you can see why that's led a lot of people to express disappointment in many of the rights found in state constitution. If rights are ropes and courts are the institutions that tie those ropes around the state, then the first thing we should look for in assessing whether rights are working are court decisions that strike down state policies on the basis of state constitutions. And certainly that does happen. And I think state court enforcement of education rights is a really good example of that phenomenon. But I also think it's fair to say that the record isn't terribly inspiring when it comes to other rights provisions in state constitutions. So I want to propose, again, somewhat tentatively, that we think about rights not as individual protections enforced exclusively by the courts against majorities, but as resources for a group-based politics. And I've started to develop that argument by looking at Montana's constitutional convention, and in particular at the delegate statements when they debated and ultimately constitutionalized the right to a clean and healthful environment. Now, I should note that others have examined these debates, these debates especially about the, the environmental provisions in Montana's constitution, to advance arguments about how courts ought to interpret them. And that's not my goal here. My argument is not about how courts should read and enforce this text. I'm interested instead in how the history of these rights might lead us to think differently about rights in general and about the sort of political work that they do. And my thesis is that this right is best understood not as a rope that binds, but as a resource for group-based politics. Delegates to the 1971 convention expressed the opinion that they could not leave the fate of Montana's natural environment in the hands of the legislature. One virtue of constitutionalizing the right to a clean and healthful environment, they said, was that it would create a higher authority capable of forcing the legislature to do a better job of protecting the environment that it, than it had been doing up until that point. But importantly, many also expressed some concern about leaving the issue to courts. One delegate reminded the convention about the Lochner era in arguing that the state's highest court should not be the only or the ultimate authority on environmental protection in Montana. So look, we have examples of courts doing things that most of the people objected to. And, and we don't want to set up a situation where that crisis will recur in Montana. In fact, 
the convention engaged in a great deal of debate about what kind of citizen lawsuits to enable and what language would best enable them. I think one would be hard pressed to ascribe a single coherent view agreed upon by the delegates about exactly what sorts of legal challenges the constitution ought to enable when it came to this environmental provision. What does seem clear though, is the delegates agreement that whatever they drafted should serve as a resource for the people in both legislative and judicial politics. As one delegate put it, this fight for life, and I want to use that word again, this fight for life literally is our fight and we must have the equipment to wage the battle as a people. These debates are peppered with frequent discussions of children and future generations and with the hope but that many expressed that this provision would be useful in ways that they could not yet anticipate. Here's one example. Quote, it gives you a statement of public policy, which is broad and flexible so that it will cover presently recognized forms of pollution, as well as forms of pollution which are yet unknown or as yet unrecognized. Now, those of us who study rights are used to using the phrase aspirational to mean less than or not quite real. In fact, we often proceed it with the verb merely aspirational, as in this provision isn't a real right, it's merely aspirational. But one idea I've been entertaining is that it is worth defending aspiration. After all, it is the collective act of aspiring, the mounting of a social movement that brings about constitutional change. And I think in the, the reading the um, Constitutional Convention debates from Montana, we see that this is an act of aspiring hoping for something to grow into something bigger, something more powerful than the state had yet. Um, I want to call attention to the role of groups here. Environmental groups lobbied the state's constitutional convention for this provision, and the convention debates are full of mentions in particular of the League of Conservation Voters and its work to push delegates into adding constitutional rights. And it is environmental groups that then sued to enforce this provision. So um, first famously MEIC and now uh, our Children's Trust. Finally, it is also groups that hold legislators to account by publicizing their voting records. A number of political scientists and legal scholars have pointed to the connection between groups and rights, though in slightly different language. Charles Epp, for example, in his book on the rights revolutions, this is a comparative book, he's looking not just at the United States, but at other countries' rights revolutions, describes the importance of a legal support structure made up of donors who can fund litigation movements and legal academics who can supply arguments to them, along with lawyers to mount sustained iterative legal battles. So it's all of that support structure is necessary in order to generate a rights revolution. Steve Tellis, in his book on the rise of the conservative legal movement, chronicles this process with respect to the political right and the Federalist Society. He demonstrates that it took decades of movement building, of creating communities of conservatives within colleges and law schools before the Federalist Society could make an impact on the composition of courts or on judicial doctrine. Social movements take a long time to work because part of that work is challenging widely held ideas about what is reasonable and just. In Jack Balkin's terms, social movements take ideas that once seemed totally off the wall and move them into the realm of the legitimate, or as he puts it, move them on the wall. This allows more centrist elites to espouse arguments that would, without the work of these social movements, have seemed self-evidently wrong or ridiculous. Now here I'd like to kind of connect this group point to a, a different point about federalism which is that these groups are not doing kind of idiosyncratic, although they're working through states, they're not doing idiosyncratic state-centered work. Rather, they tend to be doing nationwide political work at the state level. I think that's true when the Montana Constitution was drafted, and it is true now. Delegates at the Montana Constitutional Convention describing or debating the state's constitutional right frequently talked about other states' environmental provisions. North Dakota comes up often, Illinois too. And they argue that they've, they've been in touch through the work of environmental groups. They've been in touch with drafters of other state constitutional um, environmental rights provisions. And they have useful information. They see how they've worked in other places. What they want to do is perfectly reasonable because it's part of a national strategy, even if it's not a strategy at the federal level. Even today, I think we can see that the work of realizing rights is often a group-based project. 
as I mentioned earlier, um, and I'm sure most of you know, an environmental organization known as Our Children's Trust has filed a complaint against the state of Montana, arguing that the state's complicity in the extraction of greenhouse gases violates the constitutional right to a clean and healthful environment. Now, in their work, Miriam Seifter and Jessica Bowman Posen argue that a democracy principle characterizes state constitutions. To quote them, state constitutions were drafted and have been repeatedly rewritten and amended to empower popular majorities. I think I may be making a version of that argument here, but with a different emphasis. I'm trying to think about rights themselves, not the whole constitution, but particularly rights provisions, as stemming from and providing resources for the democratic process, rather than as checks on democracy. And in talking to my fellow panelists earlier this week, it occurred to me that I really ought to make a distinction here that I, I hadn't thought of before, that there may be a difference between national interest groups mining state constitutions for rights that could be useful in their own political projects, and rights politics that bubble up from within a state. You could certainly describe both, both kinds of politics as people using rights as resources for democracy, but we might want to be careful to distinguish these two different kinds of democratic politics. Now, this is more speculative, but I wonder a bit about our habitual recourse to the phrase individual rights. And I certainly the, the delegates to Montana's constitutional convention often talked about this right as an individual right. But I think it may be fruitful to try to think beyond that kind of um, habitual connection of rights and individuals. So in their book, How Rights Work, Mila Verstig and Adam Chilton have made the point that, and they're looking at national constitutions, but that the rights in national constitutions that work are the ones they call group rights. Rights like labor rights or religious rights. Rights that are associated with ready-made groups who can spring into action in their defense. And they contrast these group rights with individual rights. But I've been inspired by this very impressive work to wonder whether we might want to describe all rights as group rights. For all of our use of the phrase individual rights, rights are in practice brought into being by groups and then realized when groups take them up in either legislative or judicial venues. So finally, let me conclude by talking for a moment about the question of timing. When can you know whether a right has worked? When we imagine rights as ropes, we want them to work right away and all the time. If they're binding me to the mast, I should be bound from the get-go. But if we think about rights as resources, I think the picture looks a little bit different in this respect. Resources can sit around for a while and still be drawn on much later. And I would argue that the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution provides a really familiar example of this phenomenon. So the U.S. Supreme Court did not really protect speech, even political speech, against either federal or state censorship until the 20th century. And it only started to do that when the ACLU and like-minded civil libertarians mounted a sustained set of arguments, both inside and outside of courts, that this constitutional provision ultimately should offer meaningful protection. In other words, the First Amendment, I think, wasn't a failure or wasn't merely aspirational. It was a resource. It was sitting, waiting until a group could come and use it. This is, I believe, an optimistic, to be sure, but reasonable way to think about the environmental rights in Montana's state constitution. Important litigation has helped to enforce this right, but and here I know I show my hand as someone who studies political history. I think it's too soon to say whether rights like this, this right in particular, or rights like this have worked, can work. The better question might be whether they can serve as a resource for reform. My fellow panelists are going to talk in more detail about two other rights in the Montana State Constitution. And having heard and read a bit about the, their work, I know you're in for a real treat. So if nothing else, I hope these thoughts have framed a useful discussion of their really interesting and important work on the rights in Montana State Constitution. Thank you. So Emily, thank you so much. Uh, we'll hear now from Constance. Thank you for the introduction, Judge Halligan. I'd also like to thank uh, all the editors and staff of the Montana Law Review, um, in particular the, the symposium editors, Blake and Lauren, for all of your work. Um, 
really excited to be on this side of room 201. So, um, and I want to thank all of you too for spending your Friday afternoon um, thinking about the Montana Constitution. My plan is to talk um, specifically about Article 2, Section 9 of the Montana Constitution, which is um, colloquially referred to as the right to know. Um, I'm going to read it briefly and then um, move on. No person shall be deprived of the right to examine documents or to observe the deliberations of all public bodies or agencies of state government and its subdivisions, except in cases in which the demand of individual privacy clearly exceeds the merits of public disclosure. I want to I want to start with just a brief um, some context and maybe a disclaimer that I'm litigating a case against the governor under the right to know right now. Um, and in that case, the governor asserted um, executive privilege and deliberative process privilege in response to a citizen request for information under the right to know. Um, I'm not going to try to restate my brief or, or you know, convince you um, about that, but that litigation kind of framed this question for me, um, which isn't really one that can be presented in a 20-page legal brief, and that question is, is constitutionalization of the right to know meaningful, and if so, you know, why and how? Um, so I want to start with a general background on the right, uh, focusing on that question of, of whether and why it's meaningful when a few other jurisdictions do have constitutional rights to know, um, and every other state and the federal government have some sort of statutory scheme governing open records. And then I want to talk kind of more about the principles underlying the right to know and the broad implications um, informed by those principles that should kind of color judicial interpretations going forward. And then finally, I want to talk, touch more briefly on, on sort of an emerging issue, which is related to that case that I was talking about, um, which has to do with intersection between government transparency issues and the separation of powers under both the Montana Constitution and the federal Constitution. So as a constitutional right, our, our constitutional right to know truly is unique to Montana. Um, during the convention, the Bill of Rights chair, Wade DeHood, described it as an A-plus constitutional provision. Another delegate in response, I, I think it was Fred Davis, said, you know, sure, it's an A-plus provision, and that's only because, like, nobody else is in the room at all. I'm paraphrasing here. Um, this is a crazy thing. No other constitution does this. Nobody else is going to do this. So, um, you know, that question, the, the uniqueness of the right was really squarely in the minds of the convention delegates when they chose um, to put it into the constitution, um, which then went out to the people. Outside of Montana, Six other constitutions do include some sort of constitutional right to know, but they're all really meaningfully distinguishable. For the most part, these provisions express a public policy of government transparency, and they do that using rights-conferring language. But at the same time, they also include restrictions that undermine the breadth of the right, and they expressly give to the legislature the power to define the scope of the right. So um, Florida is a really good example. Florida's constitutional right to know um, is, unlike Montana's, not a model of clarity. It includes several subparts, and it starts with this really broad expression of the right. Um, and it even applies to the judiciary on its face. It applies to every state, um, every state body every local government body, and that's part one, but then you get to part two, and it says it does not disturb any existing sort of regulation under the open records laws, and then it also gives to the, to the legislature going forward the power to enact 
um, a comprehensive open records scheme by a three-fifths majority. California is really similar in that way. Um, it does not modify any existing rights, and it actually also exempts entirely the state legislature um, and gives the ball to the legislature to kind of whittle down or define the scope of the rights. Illinois, Louisiana, and North Dakota have very short constitutional provisions that say, you know, the people have this right except as provided by law um, or in, in cases established by law. The only constitutional provision that arguably comes even close is in New Hampshire. New Hampshire sets up its constitutional right to know with kind of a, an expression of the importance of government accountability and transparency. It says, government therefore should be open, accessible, accountable, and responsive. To that end, the public's right of access to governmental proceedings and records shall not be unreasonably restricted. And New Hampshire's provision was enacted kind of roughly contemporaneously with Montana's in 1976. I think the really important point there is, um, I think it is expressing the same, the same principles as the Montana constitutional right to know, um, but it also states that the right should not be unreasonably restricted. And so by implication, the New Hampshire legislature um, gets to weigh in on what is a reasonable restriction of the right to know. So kind of trying to synthesize all of these other constitutional provisions, all of these other states, you know, hand the ball over to the, to the government to say what the right of the people is. Um, maybe with the exception of New Hampshire, the constitutionalization of the right in these states does not appear to be particularly meaningful because, again, every state has some sort of legislative scheme governing open records. And so um, if in these other states, at most they express a, a, a statement of public policy and then say, and the legislature can do what it does in every other state. But Montana's constitutional right is really immediately distinguishable. Um, it does not give the legislature the right to, the ability to define the right. And the right is self-executing as the Montana Supreme Court has determined. Um, at the same time, there has to be some regulation, right, because the government has to act in response. And so Montana has freedom of information laws and it has um, regulations that govern how agencies are going to respond to information requests. But because of our right to know and because there isn't this express delegation of, of authority to the legislature or to agencies, any one of these laws or regulations um, or an agency's implementation of them could be subject to a constitutional challenge. So it really leaves an open question. We can't, as, as lawyers, we can't do what we are really prone to doing, which is to look to other jurisdictions when we have an open question and say, oh, the facts are really similar, so I'm going to try to get the court to do this thing. You can't do that because there aren't any other states, there aren't any other jurisdictions that have an analogous right. The Montana Supreme Court has recognized the strength of the right, saying it is a fundamental right subject to the highest degree of protection. It has described it as unique, clear, and unequivocal, um, but it hasn't resolved all of the questions that do arise under the right to know and that are likely to arise under the, know, under the right to know. So um, I think we can look a little bit deeper to try to figure out what it means. Um, and I think we can do it kind of in two ways. First, because we do have such rich source materials, we can look to the, um, the documents contemporaneous to the drafting and the ratification of the Constitution um, and exhaust the research in a way that we really can't do um, it with older documents like the federal Constitution. And then I want to... Um, employ more of a structuralist approach, looking at the right to know 
within the context of the Montana Constitution more broadly, um, and particularly, there's quite a bit of intersection with, with some of the other speakers, um, particularly in regards to, to the right to know as a democracy promoting principle in a, an, a constitution that is more democratic than the federal. And my kind of working thesis on this is that not only um, should the right to know be viewed as an individual right, but it kind of recasts the people as a functional component of the government itself. The people are the source of all government power through the Constitution. They also have a role to play in Montana's government above and beyond voting for elected representatives. Um, these democracy principles baked into the Constitution should inform our understanding of the constitutional right to know, and the right to know can also kind of inform our understanding of Montana's system of democracy as well. The framers, in, in when they were drafting um, and voting on the right to know, um, were also really concerned with an issue, a related issue, which was the ballooning of um, state agencies with essentially no oversight by elected officials. Um, so they were worried that government was growing in size and scope in a way that prevented citizen oversight. Part of their response was to restructure government so that the governor and other statewide elected officials could be kind of at the top of the, the org charts for state agencies so that voters then would have a say in determining how these agencies work. The right to know it should be seen as a really essential part of this project of restructuring in 1972. And because it came hand in hand with reorganization, it gave an opportunity for really a clean break from past practices which were marked by um, obscurity and by refusal to answer to the people. So, you know, I think, I know the focus of the symposium here is kind of what comes next, but I think we can also kind of take a moment and think about just how much progress really was made in 1972 when it comes to government transparency. Prior to that, um, agencies, local government boards often um, operated in near complete secrecy. Um, and so there is an area in which we can see that we have a really meaningful and direct change. The governors, the, the framers really wanted to open up the government to make it less dysfunctional. Um, but there's also this really kind of optimistic mood that's presented in the debate on this provision. They wanted to give citizens the ability to understand the government. So they use this kind of positive, optimistic terminology during the debates. They talked about opening up government documents and deliberations in order to kind of temper un inappropriate and unnecessary criticisms of pu public servant servants, kind of with the theory that transparency promotes trust. And if the people of Montana can really understand, can see people working, can see how difficult their jobs can be, they can they can be more empathetic to individual kind of public servants than they might otherwise be. And so I think that there's this kind of a hopeful current that runs through the debates on the provision and that the provision itself really is hopeful. It demonstrates that the people should be trusted to understand and to make important decisions, um, not only about policy, but really about how the government itself should work. And the overall structure of the Constitution reinforces that point. So where um, I don't want to, I don't want to restate points that have already been made um, very well, much better than I will make them. But you know, the federal system is a really straightforward representative democracy. If you want to get something done in, under federal law, 
you need an elected official with the power and the interest to get it done. Um, if you want to amend the federal constitution, it's, it's technically possible, but it's extraordinarily difficult. difficult. It's really different in Montana. Um, we have representative democracy, you know, but we also have a citizen legislature. We have the ability to directly create policy through the ballot initiative um, and constitutional initiative powers. And we can exercise those powers without the help of elected officials. So in this way, our Constitution by design is more democratic than the federal Constitution. Um, and as Professor Seifter, Seifter um, discussed, um, you know, many of these provisions are found in other constitutions, other state constitutions. The ballot um, and constitutional initiative powers are common with other states, but the right to know is 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 unique um, and and kind of adds another layer of citizen participation in government. So our constitution doesn't create a government that then goes on to kind of operate independently from the people, subject only to um, recall at the ballot box. Our constitution creates a government in which the people remain active participants, um, not only in selecting representatives, but in official government deliberations themselves. And the right to know is a really fundamental piece of that overall structure. And so I'd like to kind of transition now to that third piece, which is um, an emerging issue under both kind of federal and state law. And that has to do with um, the intersection about with government transparency issues and the separation of powers. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of, of litigation and even more um, news about the scope of the federal executive power recently um, because of congressional oversight um, related to um, things that occurred during the Trump administration and also um, criminal and civil um, litigation and investigations um, regarding that administration. And I don't want to get too deep into that, but the point I want to make is that under the federal system, the executive privilege arises out of separation of powers concerns. So the argument is we have three independent branches of government in the federal system. And if the judiciary or Congress is going to search really deeply into how the executive does its job, it violates those separation of powers principles. And, you know, it's, this isn't just executive privilege, isn't the only thing that kind of arises about out of this or is similar to that. We also have, you know, a, uh, Congress has very limited ability to exercise oversight over the judiciary as well. And separation of powers considerations often inform how the judiciary um, responds to requests that it, it really closely scrutinize congressional intent. And there isn't a huge body of law examining um, federal executive privilege. It wasn't expressly recognized by the U.S. Supreme Court until um, the investigation, well, until um, Nixon's impeachment proceedings had begun and there was a criminal investigation um, in, I think it was Nixon v. United States, it, I might have those flipped, um, the court recognized that there is an executive privilege but that it's not absolute and it's not unqualified. Um, and in that particular case, the tapes and documents that were subject to a subpoena had to be turned over despite them being, including evidence of sort of executive decision making. And there's some emerging scholarship, because this issue is pretty timely, there's some emerging scholarship about the scope of the federal executive privilege. Um, and a lot of it is really critical of broad assertions of executive privilege as applying anywhere other than um, within discrete conflicts between the branches of government. 
So um, while there probably is, there may be an executive privilege to not be forced to testify in front of Congress as the president, that doesn't necessarily mean that those same considerations um, are at play when you're dealing with like a criminal investigation. And a lot of other states have looked to federal law and have adopted executive privilege, um, considering their governors to be analogous to the president under the federal system. And the issue that I want to explore is how separation of powers principles um, should inform this issue given the elevated people of our constitutional right to know and, and the fact that when an individual um, issues an information request, when an individual asks for um, information from the governor, for example, the separation of powers considerations that inform executive privilege really aren't there, right? Because the individual is not another branch of government that needs to operate independently and perform an independent role from that of the governor. And my, my kind of tentative thesis here is that, um, you know, in Montana, state actors really can't assert privileges that are grounded in federal separation of powers principles because the right to know, along with this other suite of um, democracy promoting constitutional provisions, really fundamentally alters the equation. And this doesn't just apply to the governor, but also the legislature, and I think much more controversially, the judiciary. Um, in Montana, under our constitution, the people are not only the source of political power, but they remain active participants in the work of governing. Um, the government is not designed to operate independently from the people the way that the federal executive is designed to operate independently from the um, federal legislative branch. And so in Montana, given the right to know, given the broader structure of the Montana constitution, Government can't assert privileges, can't shield information from the public by referring to these separation of powers principles. So Constance, thank you very much. Those are all so timely and I'm sure there'll be questions after um, because of the timeliness of that. Um, Anthony, would you like to begin? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you so, so much, Judge Halligan and, and uh, my co-panelists. Uh, thank you to the Law Review and the editors for inviting me here. It is so wonderful to be back in Montana. Um, since I clerked, I hadn't been here other than to drive my mother through the state when we moved her at a very high speed. So it's good to actually stay here for, um, for a couple days. Um, so, but I have some bad news. There's a pop quiz. So. And anyone who's read my paper cannot participate. Uh, so I guess good news for you people. So name this case. It was decided within five years of the turn of the century. It concerned an economic regulation, so regulation on the free market. It applied strict scrutiny to that regulation, and it found it unconstitutional. Does anyone have an idea what that case might be? Well, it's okay that, you know, you're not raising your hands. So no gunners in the room. That's fine. Um, so some people, with people who know their, you know, con law history are probably going to guess Lochner versus New York, the 19, famous 1905 case about um, the bake shop law in New York State and the, the cap on 60 hours of work in a week that was found unconstitutional under the U.S. Constitution. Um, so that's not the answer. Uh, and the reason is uh, it satisfies three or of those four uh, criteria that I gave. But one of them was that it applied strict scrutiny. Now, if you read Lochner, I mean, they didn't even have strict scrutiny back then. But if you apply it to modern day uh, jurisprudence, it's, it's not strict scrutiny. It's some kind of, I mean, maybe it's intermediate. It's some kind of like reasonableness test. 
and the majority and Justice Harlan disagree on like what reasonable list really means. Justice Holmes is the one who says, you know, we shouldn't apply anything here. Um, but it, it isn't strict scrutiny. But the case that does satisfy those four criteria is Wadsworth versus State, which was divided by the Montana Supreme Court in 1996, written by Justice Nelson. Um, so it was very, it was very good to see him for various reasons uh, again today. So um, this case concerned a restriction on a man. Uh, well, it's, it was, wasn't just him, but employees at the Department of Revenue that they could do work in their spare time. So this guy, Mr. Wadsworth, Shannon Wadsworth, he had a side gig where he would do appraisals. And they started telling him, you can't do that. We just enacted this new rule that you can't do that. And he said, and he, and he appealed administratively and years went by and eventually they said, we gotta fire you. And so he sued and it went to a jury trial and he got damages for having been sued because it violated the state's right to, of pursuing life's basic necessities, which is in Article 2, Section 3. Um, the court also talked about how this was, and what that really means is infringing on his right to earn and a living. Now, the right to earn a living is something we at the Institute for Justice litigate all the time, but almost all the time in both federal and state court under state and federal constitutions, we're dealing with the rational basis test, right? The test that we've had since the 1930s that basically says, unless the legislature were complete and utter morons, but I repeat myself, um, the, but unfortunately it doesn't happen that way usually in court, uh, the law is constitutional. And so very rarely, right, that whether you're talking economic regulation, social regulation, whatever it is, are they found to be unconstitutional. But here, the, the, the court found strict scrutiny applied because this provision is in the Declaration of Rights, and it violated that provision. They, um, there, was a concur there was one concurrence that said we shouldn't apply strict scrutiny here. There was another concurrence that just disagreed on whether certain uh, issues should have gone to, a jur to the jury, and that was written by noted right-wing radical Justice Terry Treeweiler, um, joined by another right-wing radical, Justice Hunt. Now, the laughter in the room, for those of you who may be confused and not from Montana, is those two guys are the furthest from right-wing radicals you can imagine um, from the 1990s um, Montana Supreme Court. Justice Hunt, I, went, I ran into, he was retired by the time I clerked, I ran into him at a like, couple little gatherings when I was in Helena, and he said that um, he would throw the entire Patriot Act out. Not just like the really bad surveillance stuff, just the whole thing he thought was unconstitutional. So even him thought that this law was unconstitutional and should apply strict scrutiny. So what's going on here? What is this like Lochner on steroids doing in the Montana reports in, in 1996? Um, well, we don't really know because since then it really hasn't been followed. It's been distinguished, I think, very disingenuously. Um, and I want to talk a little bit in the short time I have about its background and then what we can do um, for its future. So it is in Article uh, 2, Section 3, which is the same provision that the um, Clean and Healthful Environment uh, provision is in that, that we heard about a little earlier from Emily. Um, it, the, interest, the, the history of this, uh, this section is, is really interesting. Um, and it goes back, actually, as far back as 1776, because this, uh, this provision is what uh, Professor Steve Calabresi at Northwestern has called a Lockean natural rights guarantee. Uh, it originally was drafted by George Mason when he drew up the Virginia Declaration of Rights in May 1776, and certain um, elements of it were lifted by Thomas Jefferson for the Declaration of Independence, but really it goes back to, to George Mason. Now, um, I have to do a little bit of segue here about why it's called the Lockean Natural Rights Guarantee. Um, and I must be careful here because we're at the University of Montana and you have a scholar here, Claire Arsenes, who just came out with a wonderful book about John Locke um, in America, John, um, America's philosopher. I'm guessing Dr. Arsenes isn't here today. I think she's in the political science department. But um, anyway, you should check out her book. It, uh, it details how often we say how 
John Locke's second treatise of government was kind of adopted by the framers, and that's, you know, the philosophy of uh, the founding. Um, and she shows how that's a lot more complicated than that. And other scholars have, have done that, too. And to a, a large part, that's, that's true. Like Jefferson especially. Jeff, Jefferson said all kinds of things during the course of his life that were very confusing and contradictory. And whether he was really into Locke or not depends on, you know, kind of what his mood was. Uh, but George Mason actually, when he wrote this document, when he wrote not just this clause, but other clauses in the Virginia Declaration of Rights, it seems like he was working off of Locke's second treatise of government. And the idea is here, right, is social contract theory, that um, there is no actual social contract, some state in nature that never really existed. But the idea is that we enter into society and we have these rights. We give up some of those rights, but some we keep, and those are the inalienable rights. That's why we call them inalienable. You cannot alienate them. So some, like punishing someone after the fact who, who has wronged you, we give up to government. But some we keep. And so he listed a bunch of these in his uh, original provision, and they basically come down to acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, um, uh, pursuing liberty, and, and happiness. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but that, that's essentially what it is. Those provisions were then adopted. Um, a really cool story about how they are, which I'm not going to tell you today. Read Steve Calabresi's paper. Um, they were adopted in um, 31 states today. So the 1889 Montana Constitution had a Lockean natural rights guarantee, as did actually most of the states that became states around, around that time. Um, but it was... It was more, more or less the same thing as what Mason originally um, had penned. Now, it gets to 1972, and they're doing revisions, um, and uh, there are suggestions for how to, how to uh, add certain rights to this, uh, to this section, section th what we now call Section 3. Um, there was a suggestion that there should be a right in the Constitution to the pers or to life's basic necessities. And this was to be a positive right, that there's some minimum level of subsistence that the, that the legislature, the state, should guarantee. Um, it was put forward by a, a few very well-meaning delegates. Um, but the Bill of Rights Committee said, you know, for whatever reason, uh, we don't exactly know, but they had a statement. They think, well, we, we don't think we should really do this. We encourage the legislature to enact legislation that does this, but we don't really think it should be in the Constitution. But kind of as a compromise, they said that we want to in, put the principle of, of life's basic necessities in there. And so um, we're going to put it in Article 2, Section 3, but instead it's going to be what it is now, pursuing life's basic necessities, not to life's basic necessities. Um, now, at the same time, of course, there was a positive right, at least it's in some ways a positive right, the right to a clean and healthful environment in there. They're also added in the word health in seeking their safety, health and happiness, which I think could uh, bear fruit in future litigation at the Montana Supreme Court, but I won't get into that one. Um, and also this pursuing life's basic necessities. Now, this is really unique. I mean, it, it is unique to Montana, this clause. Um, it is also, as I, I'll get into a moment, it's been interpreted, I think properly, to protect the right to earn a living. So your right to work free from, you know, whatever, what, depending on what scrutiny you want to give it, the, some way protecting government interference on your right to earn a living, whether it's an overburdening licensing law or um, some restriction on your ability to uh, you make your goods and sell them, whatever, what, uh, whatever it is, um, that there's, a, uh, there's some, certain lines the government cannot cross. There's only three or four states in the country with an explicit right to earn a living. Uh, North Carolina has a fruit of their own labor clause. A couple others have a clause that you can you could interpret that way, or it has been kind of interpreted that way. But you, Montana has this very unique clause, and it should be very proud that it has this unique clause that protects people from the government trying to box them out of the marketplace. Um, so it's enacted, it becomes law, then later we have this case of Wadsworth. Um, and with this, 
it, it's almost unique in post New Deal America that there's something just so um, uh, stirring about the right to earn a living. There's, I mean, there's lots of cases that have found laws, uh, mostly in state court, to uh, violate the right to earn a living since the New Deal, since the, you know, um, uh, we, we have much more deferential uh, review of economic regulations, but, the, but Wadsworth really stands out. So uh, we go forward, and then we get to a case in 2006. Wadsworth, you know, Wadsworth's kind of odd because it's about this, like, in-house restriction on how state employees, you know, uh, uh, do, do their thing, but um, uh, have, can, can keep their job. But this... Uh, next stage, a uh, case called Wiser in 2006, is more a kind of a classic rent-seeking case. So in Wiser, there was um, a, uh, a law that restricted denturists. Now, I didn't really know what a denturist was until I read this case, but a denturist is someone who makes dentures. Now, dentists also make dentures, but a denturist isn't necessarily a dentist. And so you, because you don't have to like spend all the other money on, say, getting your dental license and, and a bunch of uh, all the other things that come with being a dentist or have the uh, restrictions of how many people can become dentists, if you're a dentist, you can offer dent dentures to people for a lot lower price. And there's, there was evidence in the record in this case that um, you're by by restricting dentures, you are raising the cost of people being able to afford dentures. Seems pretty right important uh, if, you're, if you don't have your teeth. Um, the law that was enacted um, that the dental board enforced said that you need to get a referral from a dentist before you can use a denturus. And of course, dentists have an, 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 have a, um, uh, have an incentive not to do that referral, but instead to keep the, keep the work in-house. So this was challenged, and the court, instead of applying uh, Wadsworth and saying, well, we got strict scrutiny here, is this, you know, are you going to survive strict scrutiny, said, well, it doesn't really even apply at all um, because they're just asking to be free from regulation. Now, I read the briefs in the case. That's not what they were asking. Um, you can say what you say about how the court wrote that opinion, um, I think it was a little disingenuous what they were saying was going on, and so it kind of just sidestepped the whole issue. There was some other language about in there about how, well, we can't be too restrictive of these kinds of regulations. Is not what was going on. Um, but mostly they, they kind of uh, distinguished the case. And the, the clause is coming up once uh, more in, uh, in a case from about 10 years ago that has to do with marijuana sales. Like any marijuana case, it's kind of weird and its own thing. Um, you know, Justice Scalia the last, used to talk about abortion law was its own thing. I think you can say the same about marijuana law. So I don't even know if that, uh, and that, that case didn't get as, in, as into the issues as, as the prior one. So that's, those are the only three cases where this, this has come up. It is, is an explicit protection of pursuing life's basic necessities, which I think has to mean earning a living. And yet, um, it, it, except for this one shiny moment, it hasn't really been taken seriously. Now, you could interpret it, life's basic necessities, as a more limited fashion. I mean, you could interpret that to mean you have a right to steal a loaf of bread. And, you know, the romantic in me kind of likes that, that, that idea. Um, I don't think that's really what the clause means. Um, I do think it means earning a living. I think it could also protect, say, the right to private charity. So there are people in various states, and we get calls at, I, at IJ about this kind of thing sometimes, about people being ticketed for feeding the homeless because the food isn't from a licensed kitchen. Instead, you know, you make your own food and give it to someone who is homeless and they're told you can't do that. That's uh, against the, this uh, kitchen ordinance, um, which I think is absurd and definitely intrudes on, life, on, on pursuing life's basic necessities, taking food from a good Samaritan. So there's various ways that this could be applied, but I think what might be going on here is in, in Wadsworth and Sames, there's strict scrutiny for this economic leg legislation. After that, people think, oh my gosh, Lock that's like Lochner, like beyond Lochner. We can't do that. And so, you know, would you like, would, 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 could you knock down, say, uh, medical licensing laws with, with that? And so in my paper, I argue, 
look, if we're going to take this seriously, like public interest lawyers like me who challenge these kinds of laws would be overwhelmingly happy if we had like some kind of intermediate scrutiny. Um, we're not looking to, you know, pass down the modern, um, uh, the, the, the modern system of, of, of regulation. We're looking to stop it when we have a self-interested body who has captured the legislature to box out competition. That is most of what's going on in some of this economic rent-seeking. And um, this is a perfect tool for fighting that rent-seeking and, um, and, and to help people try to earn a living and try to help each other. And so my hope is that in the future, when the court uh, comes across this clause again, um, they will come to some kind of compromise where we can have real teeth, not the federal rational basis test, real teeth where people are boxed out of the marketplace just trying to get on the first rung of an, the economic ladder, but they're not going to upend the, the apple cart of, uh, of what government does. And I get where they're coming from there, and maybe that's a way that we can move forward. Thank you. So thank you all so much. Um, I have questions myself, but I'll defer to um, our audience if there are questions for any of our panelists. We have a few minutes. So just to start this, I think um, Emily had mentioned the power of interest groups and kind of this group uh, support in order to develop rights. And Anthony, you've just mentioned this case, which I think um, likely was lobbied quite heavily by the dentists against the denturists. Um, and so we also have the kind of lack of public interest uh, kind of law groups. And Anthony, Anthony and I have talked about the Pro Hoc Vice rule, which only allows public public interest groups to come what, in. Was any law, any firm? Yes, any, any firm more groups. than twice, except with um, without permission. And so you know there are protections about not having perhaps other people from other states come in and influence us. But I'm interested to kind of know how you see the the risks and benefits of having groups help us to define and embrace kind of the true meaning of this fairly progressive, many of these fairly progressive provisions. Um, any of you? What do you think, Emily? Yeah, it's a good, so I guess my argument, it's a, it's a great point that um, you can have a group on either side and that the, the group that wins then has a lot of capacity to define or limit the right. I guess that rather than thinking of that as um, something that's good or bad, I would say that's inevitable, <laughs> that that's just how we should understand the nature of rights politics. We don't get to pick another way. That is the way that it works. And I agree this dentist versus denturist is a lovely image of that. I mean, it, it captures that um, contest over what, you know, how, how do we interpret this? Is this really a resource for the, the denturist or are the dentists able to... Um, kind of cabin the meaning of that, right? But I think that's probably, I mean, think is too strong because as I said, this is very early work, but I guess I'm experimenting with the idea that um, there is no other way to do rights politics. That's what it always has looked like and, and really that's how rights work. Well, and as you've said, Anthony, there's perhaps an evolution um, with an early, perhaps very rights, uh, individual rights focused decision but then perhaps some limiting, and I would imagine that we want some predictability um, so that individuals can really embrace these rights moving forward. Yeah, and I, a lot of it really does come down to the lawyers. Um, and you're talking about you know uh, public interest firms, so we have public interest firms in the state, like like now Upper Seven. Um, uh, Institute for Justice, we don't have an office here, so if we come in and do a case, like a, a case we had about um, a, a, a regulation on doctors giving medicine to their patients, which is a one case we've done under this clause, but it, it got mooted by the legislature, um, that's us coming from outside the case, or out, 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 out side of the uh, state, but I, I, I mean, generally, um, the, the one thing I, I'd say about that is that, um, you know, whether it's private lawyers in their private capacity representing someone um, pro bono and taking a case, or whether it's a, a public interest law firm, most cases that really change things um, that you've heard about in your reports, whether it's state or federal, those are 
test cases that um, government attorneys in, in cases that I've been involved with and we see on the other side love to say this is a test case, meaning this isn't real. This is some outside group that's trying to gin up some trouble and make some attorney's fees and has filed um, a, a lawsuit without an actual controversy. Um, first of all, that's not true because of standing rules. So you have to have a controversy. And um, there are people hurting who will benefit beyond that case. But also, that's true of most cases that um, are in our constitutional history. Um, and so we shouldn't be, su we, you can be suspicious of, the, of whatever the lawsuit is, um, but you should be suspicious on the merits, not on the motivation of, you know, whether, uh, whether the person is being paid or not. I have to know that this denturist case, pretty sure, um, you know, they were, they got the attorneys they could and they, they did the best job they could. They didn't do a perfect job, but they did okay. Um, and so that's going to vary in, in lots of different lawsuits. And you, you hope you get good attorneys on both sides to distill this stuff up to Constance. Yeah, I, I've just kind of started thinking about this. And I think this is an, I'm too self-interested. So this couldn't possibly be an area of scholarship for me. But some sort of question about the ways in which um, provisions authorizing attorneys' fees influence sort of the cases that are brought um, and potentially, you know, outcomes. So uh, my, the law firm I work for is donor funded. We don't make decisions, litigation decisions based on whether or not there will be attorney's fees at the end of the road. Um, but most attorneys don't have that same opportunity. Most attorneys have to bring in money from litigation. So you need to either have a client who for you know whose interest would be advanced by a particular interpretation of a constitutional right, or you need to have an attorney's fees provision that would incentivize litigation. Um, so under federal law, 1983, attorney's fees are available um, basically as a matter of right to prevailing plaintiffs, um, and that is because. Congress very expressly wanted to incentivize civil rights litigation. Um, one of the reasons I think that there is a much greater body of judicial interpretations of the right to know than other um, constitutional rights under Montana law is because the statutory scheme does provide for an award of attorney's fees, and the right to know is really unique that way. Questions? So I know that it's been kind of a long day, and I'm just going to check my time. We have some wonderful provisions, and I think we're all very proud as Montanans to see our Constitution and work toward uh, developing it in the manner in which it was intended. Um, do you have suggestions, I guess? Uh, you know, obviously a lot of these provisions have not been subject, and some of these are so unique that um, they're there really isn't any case law, any guidance. Um, you know, uh, as a judge, I haven't had a lot of opportunity to weigh in on questions of constitutional interpretation. And again, perhaps there's reasons for that. But we have a lot of young attorneys who um, I hope are inspired by the discussions that they've heard. Do you have um, thoughts to give to either students or others in the in, in the audience? Well, I just like to say I, I want to add like second and third, what uh, Representative Kratner said earlier about the unenumerated rights clause in the Montana Constitution, um, that most, most of what I talk about these days is unenumerated rights. And uh, it's very unexplored. Um, it should be explored in a, in a good way um, for, because in that being enacted in the Montana Constitution and many other constitutions, the people wanted the judges to protect those rights. And the judges may say, and that's, this is why we call our organization the Center for Judicial Engagement, that the judges like to say, oh, I don't want to get involved with that. That's, that's for the legislature. But that's not what the, the document says. And so um, if there are young attorneys out there who want to, you know, to try to figure out how to, how to enforce the unenumerated rights beyond just the rights that are in the Montana Constitution, um, I'd love to talk to them sometime. Thank you. Constance, any thoughts? Uh, I just, you know, I think um, as a, a recent graduate of this law school and a fairly, and a really still a new attorney, 
you know, um, for those of you who are in law school, um, I just want to really encourage you to work on constitutional issues as a student um, through your scholarship and then also out in the world. We do, because, because of the Constitution that we have, because of the kind of lack of interpretation, there's real opportunity for lawyers to do meaningful work in this area. Um, and so, you know, don't, just don't forget about it. And Emily, any thoughts? Oh, um, no, I was, I, I, I loved that um, exhortation not to forget about state constitutions. I think I'll, I'll, I'll join that. And I, I, because we're so short on time, I just wanted to say, I always learn an enormous amount from people who are actually using state constitutions. And um, I feel very privileged to have been here and learned from my fellow panelists and to have spoken with you, Judge Halligan. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. And thanks to our panelists.